if you and I, Christina, wanted to start our own mutual fund, I don't know why we would. There are more mutual funds than there are Taco Bells. There are actually more mutual funds than there are securities to put into them. But if we want to, we would have to comply with the Investment Company Act of 1940. So, you know, uh, you know, it's more about answer sets than it is about sometimes the actual question. And what I mean by that is you're held accountable for the Securities Act of 33. You're held accountable for the Securities Act of 34. And you're held accountable for the Trust Indenture Act of 39. And you're held accountable for the Investment Company Act of 1940. And depending on uh, what they're asking will depend on the answer. If I say, which of the following deals with prospectuses, paper, new issues, the primary market, you'd say 33. Sometimes you can get questions right by just covering up the screen and saying, are they asking me about prospectuses, paper, 33? Are they asking me about people and places, 34? Now, this is about exchanges. It created the SEC, the market centers, that's 34. The Trust and Denture Act 39 is about bonds and having covenants between the issuer and the trustee for a bit of the bond folders. And today, what we're discussing is the Investment Company Act of 1940. And you do get tested on some of the requirements of the Investment Company Act of 1940. The first rule of the Investment Company Act of 1940 is you have to classify yourself as either a face amount certificate company, who cares? A management investment company, we care. When I say we care, I mean for test purposes. Now, we care for test purposes because that's where the vast majority of these questions on your exam are going to be coming from. And the biggest component of this section that we want to be able to do is contrast open-end mutual funds with closed-end mutual funds. So that's where we're heading. Now, you uh, low probability may get a test question on unit investment trusts. You know, the number one reason people buy investment companies is to avail themselves of professional management. You know, I have a friend of mine, Clarice. I say, Clarice, do you have the time, temperament, and expertise to be managing money? And she says, God, no. I said, well, then you ought to hire yourself a professional manager. She says, Dean, I can hire a professional manager for as little as $500. I said, there are men and women who sold their soul, Clarice, to manage that $500 for you. You know, mutual funds are the easiest way for people to avail themselves of professional management. Now, in a unit investment trust, the assets are not professionally managed. They're professionally selected. What we mean by that is it's a fixed portfolio. So we're going to pick out these, uh, for example, muni bonds or whatever the case may be. But it's passively managed. That means no active management. Now, the advantage of passive management, fixed portfolios, are less costs involved. And that means less cost, more tax efficiency. And that would be an aim and shoot point and click question. Which of the following investment companies has a fixed portfolio of professionally selected assets that aren't being actively managed? And we say unit investment trust. Now, the biggest part of these exam questions are contrasting open-end investment companies with closed-end investment companies. How are they different? And boy, this slide is so target rich. There are all kinds of test questions on this slide. Lots of them. You know, in a traditional open-end mutual fund, we're continually offering new shares to the public. So that means not only are we going to have to comply with the Investment Company Act of 1940, we're also going to have to comply with 33, meaning I have to give you a prospectus, Christina, so you can make an informed decision. You say, Dean, should I read the prospectus? I go, absolutely, you should read the prospectus. You know, Christina, one of the great things about a mutual fund 
is anytime you want, you can send in a redemption request. You know, mutual funds, open-end mutual funds, don't trade in the secondary market. Open-end mutual funds are issuing new shares. It's a primary transaction. And anytime they, uh, you send a redemption request, within seven calendar days, they're going to have to cash you out at the NAV, the net asset value. You say, Dean, how much money am I going to get if I redeem my shares? I say, I don't know, Christina, because we're always doing business based on the next calculation of the NAV. So when you come into a open end mutual fund or go out of it, you say, how many shares am I going to get? I say, Christina, I don't know. I don't know until we do the next calculation. Uh, test question, what is that concept called that in an open end mutual fund, we're always doing business based on the next calculation of the NAV? That is test question That's called forward, so forward pricing, right? Very testable, this idea. Now, the reason it's also very testable is because that's a contrasting point between other things you get tested on that don't trade based on NAV, but rather trade supply and demand in the secondary market. Be careful. You know, if you've been watching me on my channel or spend some time with me or you haven't, doesn't matter because now I'm going to tell you, RTFQ. That stands for read the full question, right? That 69 is so disappointing because that means you knew the stuff. So I don't know what variable it is, Christine. It could be changing answers. It could be you got to face a death draw. I'm wishing for you the next draw, a dream draw. Everything you <laughs> study shows up and you say, woo, you know, who knows what it is. It's not that you didn't put in the work. You know, I had another person today who got a very disappointing score, very high not passing score. And uh, she was afraid that her employer may not send her down there for the third at bat. I said, I think they will, because, you know, most people know if you get those high 60s, you put in the work. There's some other variable. It's not that you didn't, you know, below 60 means you just, you know, you didn't put in the work or whatever. So um, I am not saying that open and mutual funds cannot own preferred stock. They can and do. I'm not saying that open and mutual funds can't own bonds. They can and do. What I'm saying here, test question, is that an open-end mutual fund cannot issue preferred stock, cannot issue bonds. That's what we mean when we say they can issue common stock only. The fancy word for saying that is they can only have one class of equity. Now, I'm not a good prospect for a domestic mutual fund. You know, because if you ask Dean, call it hubris, but you say, Dean, do you have the time, temperament, expertise to be managing money? I say, yeah, Christina, I, I do. I did it professionally for many years. Now, I'd be the first to admit that in certain areas where I need to have an asset allocation, perhaps I don't have the time, temperament, expertise. You know, for example, I think Mexico uh, is a great investment opportunity. But, you know, rather than Dean trying to buy Mexican securities in the Mexican marketplace, I think, you know what, I probably should hire a local to do that for me. And so I might want to consider buying, test question, the Mexico fund. The Mexico fund trades on the New York Stock Exchange under the ticker MXF. They did a one-time initial public offering, and now that closed-in fund trades in the secondary market. The Mexican marketplace is very volatile. And I don't want my portfolio manager to have to liquidate his securities. So we tell you in a closed-end fund, if you're not happy, you simply sell your shares to someone else for more than or less than you originally pay. Now, if the Mexico fund chose to, they could issue preferred stock and tell the Mexico fund preferred stockholders they're going to pay them 5% take the money, make additional investment in Mexico. If the Mexico fund chose to, they could issue bonds. Promise the bondholders 8%, make additional investments in Mexico. It's a testable contrasting point that closed in funds can issue preferred and bonds, open in funds cannot. So this is a testable distinction. How are they different? One difference is this right here. This idea 
that open-end funds only have money to manage from issuing new shares, common stock. Now, we're not talking about how we charge you. Now, we're talking about A shares and B shares. We're just talking about there's one share class. Whereas closed-end funds can. Very testable. Open-end funds, there is no secondary trading. Closed-end funds, there are. The Mexico fund, Christina, could be pay, pay, trading for more than its NAV per share. The same as the NAV per share, less than the NAV per share. The only time if I show you like an exhibit and I tell you it's a fund that has a price lower than NAV, it's got to be a closed-end fund. You got to tell me it's a closed-end fund. No secondary trading. So the formula, supply and demand, the formula for an open-end fund, test question, is the NAV plus the sales charge equals the public offering price. And the Investment Company Act of 1940 says that we have to uh, calculate the NAV at least once per business day. Usually we do it after the market close. And so let's say, I'll just make up one. Uh, let's say that the NAV of the mutual fund is $9.15. And let's say that the sales charge is 85 cents, just making this up. That would mean the public offering price is $10. So that's the formula. So that means an open-end fund would never, ever, ever be sold at less than its NAV. The most we can charge is 8.5%. That's testable. The X date, the X date, so... Now, Christina, you look uh, too young, perhaps, to have an ex-spouse. But X means without. So if I say, do you have an ex-spouse, that means you're no longer trading with your spouse attached. Now, remember, when you're doing business with an open-end mutual fund, you're doing business directly with the fund. There is no secondary market. You know, we have this thing called the Uniform Practice Code, which standardizes trading practices in the securities industry. And the UPC, the Uniform Practice Code, doesn't apply to open-end mutual funds. So in an open-end mutual fund, all of the dates are set by the board of directors. The board of directors sets the declared date, they set the record date, and the X date, the first date on which the mutual fund no longer trades with the dividend attached is the day after the record date. Now, if it's trading in the secondary market, and I'm glad I grabbed this uh, slide deck because we need to fix this. I told you the X date in secondary trading is set by the Uniform Practice Code. And in secondary trading, and remember closed in funds, and closed in funds, they train the secondary market. So, so the X date uh, is the same as the record date. What I mean by that is of the record date, we say we're going to pay a dividend, Christina, to shareholders as of Thursday, September 16th. And what we're saying is if you're one of our owners of our corporation on this date, you get the dividend. If you're not on our share order list on that date, you don't get the dividend. So if you buy the stock on the record date, T plus one, trade date is when we agree to terms, trade date. Settlement is when ownership changes hands, and that's T plus one. So that means you won't be on the share order list until Friday, you wouldn't get it. Now, I've mentioned the uniform practice code to you. And now we talk all about answer sets. You know, if I say on the test, which of the following standardizes practices, trading practices within the securities industry, you would say the uniform practice code. But there's another, I think we should be aware of on the test, and it's called the code of conduct. You know, the code of conduct is the ethical behavior that we owe customers. 
and we love to torment you on unethical business practices. You know, on this test, you got to believe in human depravity and original sin. And, you know, if we didn't have any rules, you know, things would be running amok. I say, Christina, if you buy the uh, mutual fund today, you get the dividend. But if you wait until tomorrow, you don't get the dividend. If you buy the stock, or in this case, mutual fund, the day before the X, you will get the dividend. And if you wait till tomorrow, you don't. You've heard of dividend capture programs, haven't you? You should buy it today. You said, well, Dean, isn't it going down by the amount of the dividend? Aren't you just creating an unnecessary tax situation for me? Can I talk to your supervisor? Uh-oh. A big no-no, big test question, is we're not supposed to sell dividends. That's a big no-no. That's using that impending X date as an artificial sense of your urgency. We call that an artifice. You're not supposed to do that. So in mutual funds, there's two guaranteed code of conduct questions. We don't sell dividends and we don't make breakpoint sales. We'll be talking about that in a moment. You know, gotta be careful again, RTFQ. A breakpoint's a wonderful thing. And I wish other businesses were like ours, you know. Sometimes I'll be at a business, I'll say, is there any deal I don't know about? Like, what do you mean? I said, well, you know, in my business, the securities industry, we have to tell people how they get the best deal. And, you know, I was at a hotel one time and he said, well, are you here from business or leisure? I said, well, you tell me the rates and I'll tell you why I'm here. And he said, Dean, if you're in business, it's $300 a night, but leisure is $150. I go, well, leisure it is, right? So we got to tell you how you get the best deal. So we don't sell dividends. We don't make breakpoint sales. So uh, math on series seven. Uh, there are three styles of questions you get on the exam. And the three styles of questions you get are recognition, practical application, that's math, and judgment questions. You go, oh, man, I don't know. What do I do here? The second major reason people buy mutual funds is for diversification. So suitability, we said the number one reason to buy a mutual fund is for professional management. Now, I don't know, Christina, if you're uh, passing your exams and you're going to go into production and uh, sell investments to folks, but let's say you are and you pass your series seven, you come back to your manager and say, you know, I know I have a series seven, but it is okay if I just sell mutual funds. Your manager would say, that would be wonderful, right? If you want to terrify your manager, come back and say, man, I just love these uh, naked calls and margin and oil and gas wildcat programs. Oh my God. So number one reason to buy mutual funds is professional management. The second major reason is diversification. This fits into another category on your things to talk about. Uh, one of the things in terms of portfolios is what we call selection risk. Picking the wrong thing. There were 10 equally suitable ideas. I picked one of those 10. The other nine doubled in value. Mine went bankrupt. That's called selection risk. You know, Bernard Baruch, legendary Wall Street speculator, said money is like manure and you ought to spread it around. If you just pile it up, it stinks. And so the easiest way to avoid selection risk, test question, is diversification. And test question, the easiest way for most retail investors to diversify is in a mutual fund. So you get professional management, you get instant diversification. Now, you know, the test, one of my favorite uh, you know, uh, persons I tutored over the last year or so, uh, her primary language was Mandarin. And I can't even imagine, you know, and, and she said, well, are you laughing at me? I said, no, I'm laughing with you because she would call and say, Dean, my Google translator doesn't even have a Mandarin word for the word that I'm, I'm looking up in this, these testing things. I go into, so I said, well, I'm laughing because I don't think it's in English to begin with. You know, it's like learning a foreign language. So they say when you, when you dream the foreign language, that's when you know it. The fancy word for selection risk is called non-systematic risk. That's the fancy word for the exact same thing I just said, which is this idea that you should diversify as a key component. 
And so I could have said the same exact question with that phraseology. How, what's the easiest way to avoid non-systematic systematic risk is to diversify. Again, follow-up question, what's the easiest way for most people to do that? A mutual fund. And mutual funds hold themselves out and advertise as being diversified. And so the SEC says there should be some truth in labeling. If you're going to be pointing out to potential investors that you're a diversified mutual fund, then you better have as a minimum diversification 75, 5, and 10. So let's say I'm managing a $100 million mutual fund portfolio. Right? And what you're buying is, is proportionate ownership in this uh, portfolio of securities that I'm managing for you. I would have to have 75 million invested in such a fashion that no more than 5 million is any one position. And I can't be a, a principal stockholder. Now, it makes sense that I can't be a principal stockholder because I have to be able to meet redemption requests. And remember, if you own more than 10%, you are subject to volume limitations of 144. And mutual funds cannot be allowed to be subject to the volume limitations of 144 because then they may not be able to liquidate securities to meet a redemption request. By way of reminder, 144 says that if you own 10% or more of a company stock, you just can't dump it on the public marketplace. You'd have to file form 144 and it'd be good for 90 days. And you can only sell 1% of the outstanding shares or the average of last four weeks trading volume, whichever is greater. Point today's session, mutual funds can't be subject to that. So we don't let them go past 10. Now, you can do whatever you want with the other 25%. We're not trying to guarantee mediocrity here. And if you don't meet that, that's fine. But then you just can't hold yourself out to the public as being a diversified mutual fund. Most retail investors think that when they invest, that they're getting some minimum level of diver uh, diversification. Now, we said that there is some math on Series 7. And one of the maths we got to be able to do is calculate the public offering price and the percentage. And the reason this is important is because if we calculate this percentage and it's more than eight and a half percent, it's got to be a closed end fund. All right. So how do we do that? We take the sales charge and we divide by the public offering price. Now I would tell you, Christina, if on series seven, you can't decide what math to do, you should always divide. I would be doing you a great service to cover your operating key on your calculator except the divide key. Because if you're not dividing, you're usually not doing the right math. There's exceptions to that, right? But you were talking about balance sheets. Ratio means division. PE, price divided by earnings. So if you can't remember what to do on the test, take the first number in the question, divide it by the second number in the question. That's usually the right answer, right? So uh, I don't know what kind of draw you got last time. Uh, but practical application is important because there's no interpretation about the answer. You simply get it right or you get it wrong. We have share classes, again, very testable. A break point is a good thing. It's a quantity discount. You know, Christina, I try and stay out of Costco. And the reason I try and stay out of it is I just can't resist. I mean, God, I go in there and I go, I don't need two tons of salsa, but it's so cheap. And I go, you know, the reason it's cheap is because I'm buying in bulk. You know, I said, man, I like tequila, but God, I don't need a liter and a half of the thing, you know? So a break point is a quantity discount, a quantity discount. That's a good thing. And that's available for A shares. A shares typically have lower operating expenses. They have a quantity discount and they have letters of intent available. You know, if you'll tell me that you intend to purchase X number of dollars worth, we'll give you a reduced sales charge. Test question. These are suitable for somebody who has a long time horizon and a large amount to invest. Long time horizon, large amount to invest because they might be able to meet the break point. We're going to talk about that at length in just a little bit. I know you're excited. We have B shares. You know, now be careful again. The thing here the test is concerned with is misuse of no load terminology. That you're making it sound like it's some great deal. And perhaps it's not. In fact, 
this is so confusing that most mutual funds, Christina, don't even offer B shares anymore because it's just too confusing to people. But I always think of like if I'm going into a nightclub and they say, Dean, free valet parking, no cover charge. I go, wonderful. You know, I go in there, I get some bottle service. I go to get my car and they say, Dean, there's a $40 exit fee. And I said, well, I thought you told me there was no cover charge. And they said, well, Dean, it's not a cover charge. It's an exit fee. I go, whatever. They said, well, Dean, if you go back in there and you do another bottle service, we'll waive that for you. We assume, Dean, if you stay in our nightclub long enough, you'll spend enough money that it will, you know, play out that we don't need to charge you for the parking and the cover. I go, okay, I get it. So here I say, Christina, if you have a smaller amount to invest and you have a long-term time horizon, we should get you the B share. Because if you stay in the fund for a lengthy period of time, who cares? It varies from fund to fund to stipulate a prospectus. You know, I, I said to you, Christina, earlier, RTFQ. Uh, another thing, Christina, I believe in is RTFA. Read the full answer set. And sometimes I just like to shop the answer set before I even read the question. For example, if I'm shopping the answer set, it says varies from fund to fund to stipulate the prospectus. I go, God, I don't know what the question is, but that's a hell of an answer. I like that answer. I think I'm, that's the one that speaks to me. Let me go read the question and see if it's that's it, right? So sometimes that can be helpful. Now, the reason this is important is I say, Christina, if you don't stay in this mutual fund for the period, five to seven years, this could be the most expensive option for you because then you're going to get the rear end load. You're going to get charged on your way out and you would have been better served not to do this to even begin with. So a couple test questions here on the B shares. They are suitable for somebody who has a smaller amount to invest. What we mean by that is not enough to meet the breakpoint. Pretty subjective, but you know, not enough to meet the breakpoint. And then the second test question is misuse of no load terminology. We don't say that this fund doesn't have a load. We say that it does have a load, but it'll be waived if you stay in whatever that period of time is. Third test question, this could be the most expensive option if they come unsold. What I mean is they have buyer's remorse or whatever. Uh, the one they like on the test is somebody who uses a B share to buy a bond fund and then uh, interest rates go up and his NAV goes down and then he redeems and then he ends up getting have to pay the sales charge, right? And he's upset. Uh, C shares. C shares have a level load, a 12B1 fee. That's a promotional expense. Testable, promotional expense. This isn't a, an expense about managing money. It's a promotional expense for advertising, sales literature, pay salespeople, not managing money. You know, the management, uh, there's lots of expenses to a mutual fund. Some have to be one fees, some do not. But it's not managing the money. You know, I joke, there is a problem with having monkeys harvest bananas. And the problems with monkeys harvesting bananas is they eat the product. And here the product is money. So one thing we're concerned with as an investor is how much is the fund eating up in expenses? And let's say that this is 1% in your first year. Over the life, it can't be more than three quarters of 1%. You know, when I was a uh, baby broker, that's not a derogatory term. Baby broker is just a term of endearment for rookies in the securities industry. And when I was a baby broker, Christina, uh, you know, I made my living selling the Franklin tax refunds, you know, because I wasn't very sophisticated. So I thought, geez, I, I think I could sell people tax-free income. That seems to be pretty easy to do. Anyways, uh, that was my go-to kind of a uh, move. And, you know, if you uh, would invest in Franklin, the load in those days was 4%. So, you know, if you gave me $10,000, there's a 4% load, 9,600 goes into the fund. Uh, Franklin, the underwriter, distributor, sponsor, uh, takes the $400, keeps a little bit of it, pays it to my broker dealer, and I get a payout. In that example, I'm going to make about $200. Um, but you're done with me. Now, if I put you in a fund that charges you 1% a year, right? After the fourth or fifth or sixth year, you would have been better served to pay the 4% and be done with it. Right. So this is why test question, this is not suitable for somebody with a long-term time horizon. 
because that 1% every year is going to add up. And at some point, you would have been better to not have done this, right? To just pay the load on the A share and be done rather than paying this promotional expense over and over and over again. Now, a traditional no load fund, you know, this is like Vanguard. Vanguard has, let's say they calculate their NAV and the NAV is $9.15. And at Vanguard, there is no sales charge. And so that would be zero. And that means the public offering price of the Vanguard funds are the same as the NAV. That is a true no-load fund. You know, Vanguard has what over there? I don't know, trillions of dollars, let's say. If Vanguard wanted to, well, knowing my friends at Vanguard, they don't think they would do this, they could charge a one quarter of 1%, a one quarter of 1% promotional expense and still refer to themselves as a no load fund. You know, one quarter, 1% on $4 trillion. That's a hell of a lot of money, right? So test question, recognition about 12B1 fees. The test question are the no, this is a promotional expense. It's not about managing money. Some funds have 12B1 fees, some do not. And if there is a 12B1 promotional expense over the life of the fund, you'd be better served to buy an A share or a B share if you're longer term. Second test question. If you are charging a promotional expense, typically it's 1% of the first year, but over the life, it can't be more than three quarters of 1%. And if you wanted to charge one as a no load fund, you certainly can. You certainly can, but it can't be more than one quarter of 1%, right? Now, do you want to sound like a player in the business? Because players would never say one quarter, 1%. Do you know how we say that? It's not an oral test, so who cares? But in our business, you would call that 25 BIPs. That's 25 basis points. That's one quarter, 1%. And this would be 75 BIPs. Right, you can add that to your foreign language, right? You know, mm -hmm. our business has a foreign language. All right, so we're going over all these mutual funds, 20 plus questions on mutual funds. And we said a break point is a quantity discount. A quantity discount. Let me clean up my slime. And a break point schedule varies from fund to fund as stipulated in the prospectus. Uh, listen, Christina, we love exhibit questions because we know the answers there. We just got to figure it out. So let's say this is the breakpoint schedule. And uh, you say, Dean, how much should I invest in this mutual fund? I say, hey, Christina, you should invest dollars and you say, why? I said, because, Christina, if you invest $24,999, I'm going to make a 6% sales charge. And if you give me another buck, I'm only going to make a 5.5% sales charge. Am I, A, a full-service broker, or, B, violating the code of conduct? I'm violating the code of conduct. So a breakpoint sale, be careful, read the question. Breakpoints are good, but breakpoint sales are bad. That's when you're trying to maximize your commission by avoiding the breakpoint. And what's the easiest way to stay out of trouble? Is to tell you all the ways you can get the reduced sales charge. Right? So maybe uh, you say, Dean, well, gee, I'd like to invest 25000 But all I have for my initial investment is 18000 And it looks like with eighteen thousand dollars, you're going to pay six percent. So you know, eighteen thousand times six percent—that's with the load, and then the balance goes into the fund. I say, do you think? Test question, Christina. Do you think over the next thirteen months, you might be able to come up with an additional seven thousand dollars? Because if so, test question, we should fill out a letter of intent. 
Uh, test question. Is the letter of intent binding on customers? In other words, if you sign an LOI here for $7,000, is that binding on you? No. You know, the reason that's important is there's no way the customer can be heard by filling out the letter of intent. I say, Christina, if you fill out the letter of intent that you intend to come up with $7,000 more in the next 13 months, we will let you into the fund with a 5.5% loan. And that's going to be really great, Christina, because that means you're going to be able to buy additional fund shares. We're just going to escrow those shares. And if you don't fulfill it, we're going to back flag your account. You'll be in no worse position than if you don't fill it out. So if there's any doubt, you ought to fill it out. You say, Dean, there's no chance I'm coming up with seven grand. I'm not signing whatever that. I go, well, Christine, I feel bad that, you know, my sales skills are so weak because, I mean, I can't imagine why it is that uh, you don't want to sign this letter of intent anyways it's hey you're the customer uh you call me two months later you said damn dean i should have signed it i just came into some money i said well christine i got good news for you test question the yellow eye can be backdated for ninety days Test question that 90 days is inclusive of the 13 months. So that means if we wait 60 days, you got 11 months left, right? So this is the A share. This is what most broker dealers sell the most of is the A shares. You say, hey, Dean, can uh, I uh, combine my purchases for purposes of meeting the break point? I go, yeah, some funds, uh, Christina, will allow you to combine purchases. Uh, investment clubs say, Dean, can we pull our purchases? Test question, no. Investment clubs are not allowed to uh, get a break point. They're not allowed to pull their purchases together to meet that break point. And then we said, ooh, break point sale is a bad thing, right? So, Chris, you're not good if you get your Series 7, come back to your manager and say, I want to sell dividends, break point sales, do some churning, open some fictitious accounts, do some front running, you know, do some selling away. These are all bad things you're not supposed to do, right? So I said, this is very testable. You know, every once in a while, I'll have somebody say, hey, Dean, uh, do you have break points for tutoring? I think that's pretty clever. I say, okay, so you're asking me, do I have a client discount available? I said, the answer is no, not because I wouldn't offer it. It's just because my accounting would be such a mess trying to figure out, you know, the way I have it set up, Christina, it's pretty easy for me, right? You hit the button, you get billed. I don't have to send out invoices. So I spent a long time trying to make my life easier. So I have said, I'll tell you what, I don't have Christina, uh, uh, a break point, uh, but I do have rights of accumulation. In other words, uh, I'm going to charge you $225 an hour until you actually prove you're a good tutor, 2D. And if you buy X number of hours from me, at some point, then I'll give you a reduced charge, right? So the difference with an LOI is I'm giving you the reduced sales charge up front. I say, you just tell me you're going to do it. I'm going to treat you like a good customer. Breakpoints, uh, rights of accumulation, there's no time limit, but you don't get to tell you cross. So in our previous example, I say, Christina, let's at least get your rights of accumulation because then when you get past that 25 on the amount that crosses in all future investments, you get the reduced sales charge. What you have to be able to do on the test is you have to be able to contrast a letter of intent with rights of accumulation. So uh, I have another uh, Christina. Oh my goodness. I got, so I got to get my booking page. So it gives me your last name first because I've got like a half a dozen Christinas in there. Uh, you're the most important, obviously, Christina, but um, I had actually called the other Christina the wrong last name. And she goes, Dean, are you an idiot? It doesn't show up on the Zoom. I, 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 anyways, uh, that Christina, you know, we've been going through, I don't know why she doesn't want to do her own work, but she wants me to just walk her through everything. And that's fine. And so I finally gave her the break point. I said, you know, Christina, the next session's on me. I mean, God knows, uh, I think you should be using tutoring to plug gaps, not really to you know, have me read the book to you, but you know, hey, 
you know, I appreciate the business. And <laughs> so uh, you now have rights of accumulation. No break point, but uh, right of accumulation. Very testable. Very testable. Uh, I come from humble beginnings, Christina. So, you know, and, and I'm an old guy. And back in the day when I started into the industry, uh, we didn't have things like Robin Hood or commission free trading. I mean, you know, it just blows my mind. I mean, you know, when I had my own broker here, it would cost me like $50 to even process a trade. And, you know, I just went to the desk the other day. Man, I just I was so impressed. They have, you know, they didn't put the apron on me to take the x-rays. And I said, well, gee, you know, aren't you supposed to put that thing on me? And and they go, oh, no, Dean, this is new technology. You don't need to have apron because it's not even doing that. It's just a laser that's taking the pictures. And, man, easy peasy. I was in there for like, you know, 20 minutes, bing, 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 and I'm I'm done. I was like, man, this is blows my mind. And then Dennis came in and he showed me the, the the pictures and he said, see that part there? I go, well, what's that? He goes, that's from AI. AI says that tooth is a problem. I go, well, gee, do I need you anymore? I mean, <laughs> the, stuff, the world is a change. Anyways, I used to send into like Exxon Mobil, uh, what was called their dividend reinvestment program. I would send Exxon Mobil like 50 bucks. And then they would say, Dean, uh, here's 0.33 shares of uh, Exxon Mobil. And then when they would uh, offer me dividends, I'd say, well, no, 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 no. Don't send me the dividends, the cash dividends. Just buy me additional Exxon Mobil shares. Test question number one, that is called a DRIP. A DRIP is a dividend reinvestment program. DRIPs. And, you know, uh, the IRS says, Dean, as far as we're concerned, you could have got that money from Exxon Mobil. And so you're going to pay taxes as if you did get it. You know, that concept of paying taxes on money you don't actually receive is called constructive receipt. And that's where the IRS just says, hey, as far as we're concerned, Dean, you could have had the dividends and uh, you didn't take them, but that's the same. So how does that relate to mutual funds? Uh, mutual funds, I tell my mutual fund company that I don't need presently any dividends and capital gains. I would like you to uh, put them in a drip program where you're just buying me more shares. That's called a drip. And test question is that that's a taxable event. Because as I just said, the IRS says, as far as we're concerned, you could have got that money from the mutual and Christina. And that's the same as getting it. Now, second thing is we have to let you reinvest at the NAV. We can't get a continuing sales charge every time you reinvest, right? So. I told you, I sold a lot of Franklin funds. I had a guy who was sending in 4000 a month at 4%. That's $160 Dean's making every month. Now we don't let you do that. I have to let him reinvest at the NAV without the sales charge. So drips, uh, this is a term they use on the test. So what I want you to make sure you're comfortable with is what that stands for. It stands for a dividend reinvestment program. And if you have a dividend reinvestment program with a mutual fund, you're reinvesting dividends and capital gains. Assuming the mutual fund is not in your retirement plan, because then you don't have to worry about it, or your 401k. Yeah, if it's in your personal account, then this is an issue. One of the disadvantages of mutual funds is you lose tax control of your investments. Now, if we didn't have subchapter M or the conduit or pipeline theory, the corporation would make money, pay taxes. The corporation would pay a dividend to the mutual fund that owns the, owns the stock. They'd pay taxes. The mutual fund would pay me a dividend. I'd pay taxes. My God. The money would get taxed three times. The IRS has been kind enough to say that as long as the mutual fund passes through 90% of the net investment income, they'll wait and get that from the individual shareholder. I think a good memory aid device for this is die 90. Die 90. Whatever the mutual fund is receiving on dividends from the stock, plus the interest on the bonds in the stock or in the mutual fund, they have to pass through 90%. Please note, they don't pass through losses. They only pass through gains. Christina, as we said, there's lots of test questions on investment vehicles, 91 questions on investment vehicles. There is another investment vehicle very similar to a mutual fund. 
it provides you with professional management. It provides you with diversification. It too does not pass through losses, but does pass through 90% of its net investment income. Do you know what that mutual fund investment vehicle like? Not a mutual fund, but like a mutual fund is. That's called a REIT. And REITs have the same subchapter M conduit pipeline theory. A real estate investment trust, like a mutual fund, provides you professional management. Diversification, not in a portfolio of securities. In a mutual fund, you're buying proportion ownership in a portfolio of securities. Any REIT, you're buying proportion ownership in a portfolio of real estate investments. Professionally managed, diversification, they too pass through 90%. Not losses, not losses. What's the only investment vehicle that passes through both profits and losses? A C corporation. Well, an S corporation or a partnership, a direct participation program, right? Now, if I own a stock in my portfolio, I'm not a mutual fund, I own a stock. And I'm looking at my portfolio and I say, man, my investment mind says I should sell that damn NVIDIA stock. Yeah, it's been really good to me. But I say, man, you know, if I sell that NVIDIA stock, I'm going to have a huge capital gain. I'm going to owe taxes on it. You know, the capital gains tax is a transaction-based tax. And the easiest way not to pay it is not to transact. And one of the disadvantages in a mutual fund is you don't decide when to realize the tax consequences. The portfolio manager does. And so another disadvantage of a mutual fund here is that you give up tax control of your investments. And so the manager decides when it's time to sell, and then they're going to distribute that capital gains distribution to you. And whether you reinvest that capital gain distribution or not, it's taxable. For example, uh, Fidelity has a huge, huge unrealized capital gain in the Google stock. Uh, Fidelity bought 10% of Google stock at the IPO price of 85, and they still own it. They made tens of billions of dollars on that Google stock. When they sell it, if they ever do, there's going to be a huge capital gains distribution to the Fidelity mutual fund shareholders. You know, by the way, Christina, a champagne problem. I mean, you know, I had a guy bitching to me about paying it, how much taxes he paid and I finally said, John, I'm tired of you bitching about all the taxes you pay. Do you realize you're paying all those taxes because you're blessed? You know, this is a life you chose. He's bitching about his employees and his business and how difficult it is. And I said, you know, you know, John, I like you, but I mean, you know, I feel more sorry for your entry level employees than you telling me about your tax problems. So, you know, oh, well, <laughs> so uh, the Fidelity mutual fund shoulders who know, maybe they might call and start bitching the Fidelity reps. I said, well, listen, at the end of the day, it's a good thing. We made you a lot of money. Right? So, now, the holding period, we don't expect you to be an accountant. But we do expect that you have a general understanding of tax implications of investments. And to qualify for a long-term capital gain, you have to be at risk for more than 12 months. Right? And so here... Here, that's going to be based on the mutual funds holding period, not yours. Right, So if Fidelity owned it for more than a year, regardless of how long you've owned the, Fid Magellan, the Fidelity fund, it's long-term. It's based on their holding period, not yours, right? So that's important. And we, that one year is testable as well. Now, when you redeem your shares, that too is a taxable event, right? So you bought uh, at the public offering price, you redeem at the NAV, and that difference is a gain or loss depending on how long you've held it. One great investment discipline is called, Christina, dollar cost averaging. You know, it makes sense to invest in drips and drabs because that's how most people get their money in drips and drabs. So I say, Christina, how about you give me $50 a month or $100 a month to do dollar cost averaging? Test question number one, what makes dollar cost averaging work? Fixed dollars invested regularly. You know, the great thing about dollar cost averaging 
is you're going to be doing exactly what you should be doing, which is buying more shares when they're low and less shares when they're high. That's a pretty cool, cool thing, right? You're going to cut back on your purchases as the things get higher and higher. And uh, what ends up, test question number two, is you're going to have a lower average cost than the underlying shares. Pretty cool. You know, more people get where they're going. Dollar cost having in a mutual fund than any other kind of investment strategy. Yeah, I had this guy was when I was a practitioner. I said, "How did you end up here?" I mean, you know, with well, Dean, I was a city engineer. I go, "Well, yeah, I, I get that, but you know, not the way I understand it, like you did, like sidewalks and stoplights and things like that." He goes, "Yeah." I said, "Okay, so again, how did you end up here financially? Because you're in a pretty damn good spot." He said, well, Dina, you know, I got out of the Korean War. He's an old guy. He said, uh, I joined the credit union and I, when I went to work for the city and, you know, I had him taking my car payment out of my check. And when I got the car paid for, I just told him to keep taking that out of my check and put it in a mutual fund. He said, I got my house paid for it. And I told him to take my house payment, put it with my car payment and put it in the mutual fund. I joke, he's glad that nobody met him and sell, sold him a financial plan with some pie charts that would have screwed him up. But over that 30-year period with the economy going up, he's been dollar cost averaging. Now, the other thing you, we can't say on the test is we can't tell somebody this will guarantee a profit. Those two nasty words we never use in the securities industry. And those two nasty words is guarantee and approve. We never think anything say anything's guaranteed. We never say anything's approved. I joke, if you want to hear the word guarantee or you want to hear the word approved, you need to talk about a bank or about a banking product. You know, bankers selling CDs can say 4% guaranteed. An insurance agent selling insurance products can say 5% guaranteed. In our business, we say there are no guarantees. Now we have this large position in this mutual fund, and we're trying to decide which shares we want to sell. Right? So you say, hey, I say, Christina, we've arrived at our financial destination. You now have enough money working for you that you no longer need to work for your money. If you don't want to go to work tomorrow, instead of calling in sick, just call in rich. Just call in and say, you're not coming to work today. And when they say, why? You say, I got an eye problem. And they say, what's wrong with your eye? You say, I can't see coming to work. I just talked to my financial advisor. And, you know, I don't need to work anymore. Or if you want to go to work, that's fine. But that's kind of the game plan is to get you to a spot where, you know, you're not working. So now we got these mutual fund shares. We got to decide what to do with them. I say, yeah, Christine, I'm not an accountant, uh, but I would recommend that we sell the shares that we have the highest cost basis on. Cost basis is simply when you turn your money into the investment. The reason I'm recommending we sell the ones with the highest cost basis share identification is because that will generate a lower tax. Or we can do the average. We can just total up what you spent buying the shares and do an average. Test question, if we don't choose and can't document it, the IRS is going to impose on us FIFO. The first shares you bought are the first shares you're selling. And the reason is that it's typically the ones will generate the bigger tax because you have a lower cost basis on it. So whenever you get a tax question, what you want to answer is what yields the most for the U.S. Treasury, right? And FIFO is what would yield the most U.S. Treasury. Right now, the IRS uses that default, but you can choose differently. But every time they 